right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So let me get my notes. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. How are you all doing so far? Fantastic, fantastic. So far, so good. I think we've got a good start to the first day of our Mental Health Services Research Conference. On behalf of the National Institute of Mental Health, I would like to welcome you to our symposium this afternoon that is titled Strategies to Address... No, it's not that one, is it? No. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> this is the Policy Research Symposium to inform more effective state mental health, uh, uh, mental health systems for kids. And the wonderful thing that uh, I'm very excited about is because my name is Denny Pintello. I work at NIMH, and I oversee the Child and Adolescent Services Research Portfolio. And a number of these researchers are doing great cutting-edge stuff. I'm very excited to hear more about what they're doing. So, um, and, and the other thing is I know a number of you are very interested in services research for kids. So please let me know if you have any questions about applying for, for uh, um, projects and grants at NIMH. I'd love to talk, talk with you more about that. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Eric Bruns, and he is going to be the uh, chair of this panel. And then we have our speakers, and then Kimberly Hogwood, uh, we're lucky to have her as the discussant. Thank you. Thanks, Denny. So I'm Eric Bruns. I'm with the University of Washington School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, I'm, I'm a mental health services researcher and um, the chair of this symposium, which means that uh, I'm responsible for um, compelling our uh, presenters away from their homes and families in the middle of uh, summer vacation uh, season. Um, but I think that's okay because um, I think that it's fair to say that all of the folks who are here, Sarah, Molly, Kimberly, myself, are really passionately committed to this quest for uh, policy contexts in states that are going to be more hospitable to implementing accessible and effective uh, kids' mental health services. All the presenters today come from one of two different states that have centers of excellence focused on this question of um, how we can promote policy advancement as well as workforce development, quality monitoring, fi uh, novel financing strategies uh, around the kids' mental health system, uh, regardless of what the, uh, uh, the, the vast difference across state contexts. We see this increasingly across the country, which is uh, entities such as the University of Washington Evidence-Based Practice Institute, the Ideas Center at NYU, uh, which has a great partnership with the Office of Mental Health that I've learned from over the last 10 years of working with Kimberly on this. Um, and so what we're really, uh, the, our quest here is to uh, not only support the, uh, the, the implementation um, and effectiveness of effective practices uh, for, for kids, but also we, we all have um, an aligned research agenda um, that is affiliated with our work um, in states and, and in public systems. And, um, you know, so I think that as we're pursuing that quest of doing research on these policy levers that can be effective at promoting more uh, better uh, kids' mental health, um, we, we all kind of appreciate our need now at this day and age, and boy, I don't have to say it anymore after the, the big ideas talks um, and also the symposia this, this morning, that we've got to start moving from this idea of from programs to policies. This is a title of, of some talks I've seen Kimberly give, and it is really true. We have thousands and thousands of research articles out there on manualized psychosocial interventions for kids. The number of articles and, empiric and the amount of empirical research we have on the question of how states um, in particular, where really the action is, might be able to create environments uh, that will promote what we know works is incredibly small by comparison. And so um, I found a cartoon, uh, didn't have time to load it up, but you, you know the, the, the old joke about um, the person who has uh, lost uh, her keys or his keys in the park, right? And uh, someone says, you lost your keys, you know, where did you lose them? And they were looking underneath the street line. I said, well, I lost them over there. And it's like, well, why are you looking here? It's like, well, 
this is, this is where I can promote the independent variable so I can get research funding, essentially, right? So, um, you know, this, this is what we, we are trying to kind of uh, do as well as promote uh, good services in our home states, is to promote this uh, research base. So, um, but I think there's good reason for optimi optimism. There was this great symposium on financing this morning that really showed that there's great, great uh, policy research going on out there. But interestingly, four out of the five of those financing studies that were in that symposium this morning were, were focused on adults. And I think that's reflective of probably the ratio of policy research as well as intervention research that's out there relative to kids versus adults. So even though 75% of all mental uh, health uh, problems uh, have their origins in childhood, I think it's probably the other way around in terms of the research that we have. Okay, so what are we going to do about it? Today we're going to have four papers. We're going to try and keep it to 15 minutes each so we can hear from Kimberly and, and answer questions. Um, we're going to start with myself presenting a paper on behalf of first author Mylene Duong from uh, our University of Washington Department of Psychiatry who decided that she was going to maintain her week-long backpacking trip this week even though this was accepted. Um, so I'm going to, uh, a second author on this, and I'm going to present uh, our paper uh, which is a meta-analysis of studies of the rates of utilization of mental health services across sectors, which is really pretty illuminating and interesting. We're gonna, that'll be followed by Molly Finnerty. Uh, from the Office of Mental Health and the uh, Ideas Center who will be discussing the development of pediatric antipsychotic quality measures for state Medicaid programs, which is a great example of uh, uh, one of the primary policy levers that I think we have at state and managed care organization levels to try and promote quality out there for kids' mental health. Then my colleague Sarah Walker will be describing an incredibly cool initiative in our state of Washington uh, with great policy relevance as well as research applications, which is focused on um, uh, monitoring the use of children's mental health evidence-based practices uh, by looking at session notes by practitioners. Um, and finally, uh, at the end, uh, I'll put myself back up here to discuss something that we've uh, done, an extension of a long uh, series of uh, research uh, projects we've done in, co in um, collaboration with Kimberly Center about factors that seem to influence states' uptake and support to uh, child evidence-based practices, okay? So with that, we'll kick this off with this first paper, which is a meta-analysis of mental health service utilization by youth across service settings. And I want to acknowledge this is primarily the work of Dr. Mylene Duong, assistant professor in our department, uh, with help from our team at the University of Washington School Mental Health Assessment Research and Training Center otherwise known as the SMART Center. And the origins of this study are really quite simple, which is that from our own experiences submitting grants uh, in the school mental health space, we realized just how imprecise our estimates are of the utilization rates of mental health services across all the sectors that kids interact with. Um, and the bottom line is, is that if you're submitting a, a grant focused on, the, uh, on schools as a locus of identification and provision of mental health services, which studies are you going to likely cite about where kids tend to receive mental health services, right? You're going to go find those papers that say that 70 to 80 percent of all services are received in schools. Um, but such utilization studies are actually quite diverse. Um, and we see uh, that, that, you know, essentially you could probably cherry pick any any study to make the case for why the sector that you're working in is the place that's important to study the receipt of mental health services. Um, so we had this joke running at the SMART Center um, that given the number of papers that said that schools were the de facto system of mental health care for kids, we started asking ourselves, hmm, is de facto really a facto? And literally we just said, well, why don't we find out? And so um, the, the, the idea here is, is that we have, if we're going to promote good policies and strategies for how to organize, finance, manage, support the workforce, um, we actually need to know where kids are receiving these services, right? And this is only a start, right? But we, uh, we know that unlike adults, kids access mental health treatment from many sources beyond specialty mental health, right? Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that uh, if we're going to have we need reliable information on just what those rates of access are if we want to know which um, segments of the workforce to target, what kind of prevention and treatment st strategies we need to be developing so that they're fit to the settings that they're going to be delivered in, what kind of collaboration, what kind of information sharing and management functions. And there's been a lot of studies out there, um, but you know, 
We often have these uh, citations that kind of will say 1996 at the end when we want to talk about where kids are actually receiving services. But there have been a whole lot of studies uh, since then. And the, the studies, if you look at them individually, they, come, they yield a range of conclusions. Some that certain systems certainly serve as the de facto mental health service system for youths, but other ones say that they're more distributed more equitably across sectors. And the variation can be explained by both methodological as well as sampling differences and also historical uh, di uh, kind of trends over time. So you could have um, one study that gets you one answer that might be population-based, whereas another type of study that is focusing on administrative uh, you know, claims data or so forth is going to give you a completely different answer. And really, in the end, what we see is most of the time people pick the answer that they want to, want to promote. Um, so we just did a meta-analysis um, and used pretty rigorous methodology, and this is still in process. And the primary aim was to actually estimate the proportions of youth receiving services across those sectors for samples drawn from both the general population as well as those studies which are uh, even more prominent out there where it's about youth who are already enrolled in a system of care or an evaluation of a, of a system of care grant program. And we also, the second big aim is to explore what variables might explain the variance in utilization estimates so we can have that uh, information at hand uh, going forward. Um, so we have this great team at the UW Smart Center and uh, we did electronic searches. Uh, across a, a number of different um, search engines. We focused on year 2000 to the present because we wanted to focus on more recent studies because of the extraordinary changes that have occurred since, for example, the Great Smoky Mountain study, which a lot of people have relied on for a number of years. So we're looking at 2000 to the present, and we focused on search terms around mental health or behavioral health services received, as well as a whole bunch of different service settings. So here we just have example of search, search terms for the school sector. Um, and this search yielded 1,452 titles. And then we applied criteria that said that it needed to be an empirical article, it needed to be in a peer-reviewed journal or other kind of peer-reviewed outlet, it needed to be conducted in the United States because we're talking about implications for policy uh, here at home. We we're looking at uh, making sure this is about kids. And the results had to provide estimates of mental health service utilization in at least two settings to be included so that there was some kind of uh, relevance to the idea of comparative rates over, over these sectors. And the screening process yielded 14 epidemiological type studies from the general population and 47 studies of youth already receiving services in some sort of system of care. Um, so we had coders, 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 coders. We got good reliability of coding. Um, with uh, median scores uh, for ICCs and CAPAs listed here. We, we felt pretty good about our, our methods, let's put it that way. And just so you know, we are going to assess publication bias, um, and that's underway. Um, and because of between study variation, a random effects meta-analytic model was, was used, and you can see some of the details here. We used meta-regression models to test those moderators of service utilization rate estimates based on the characteristics of the studies. So. With no further ado, I think that the results section is a whole two slides. Um, I'm curious, what do people think is the most common service setting for kids according to 40, uh, let's start with the 14 uh, general population studies that we found in the literature since 2000. What do you think is the number one service setting in which we found on average across those, all those studies um, that the kids receive services? Well, we're talking mostly about uh, uh, specialty mental health outpatient care, schools, juvenile justice, child welfare, um, and what am I missing here? Oh, uh, primary care are the, are the big five, so to speak. What do people think? Primary care, the most common setting that kids receive mental health services. Okay, that, that seems to be some consensus. The answer is, eh, that's not right. So, in fact, if you look at the epidemiological studies, in fact, schools do come out as the number one setting in which all kids receive mental health services. So according to the studies that we found in the meta-analysis, 9% of all uh, kids, and obviously this doesn't, this is, these are not mutually exclusive categories within the studies or across, but 9% of kids receive care in schools, just under 8% in outpatient settings, and over about 5.5% in primary care. Now what you notice is, is that 
Those bars in red from the general population studies are different from the 42 studies of youth already enrolled in services or those that looked at um, administrative data or claims data, which showed that actually outpatient uh, settings were the most common, but only beat out schools by about 36 percent. And our guess is, is that that's probably a bit of an overestimate against schools because schools aren't likely to be as captured as, as easily by some of the administrative data that those studies used. Um, I see questions. Yes, outpatient, especially mental health. Yep, yep. Uh, and what's real interesting is, is that if you do look at the studies uh, uh, within systems of care or of kids who are receiving some kind of service, you see quite high rates of inpatient, residential, uh, juvenile justice, child welfare um, that actually eclipse primary care in some instances, which may be a little bit concerning to some of us who are trying to rebalance uh, systems of care for kids. Um, so this is very, very interesting. And we asked, well, what are the things that might be moderating the findings? Now, it's a small number of studies if you're only talking about 14 or 42. And what we found is, is that looking at the uh, setting of the studies, insurance status of the, of the kids in the, in the samples, the sex, age, race, the year of publication, none of these things were actually found to be significant predictors of what the rates were across all the settings. And I'm only showing you, you can only do this kind of one sector at a time and using standard meta regression techniques, and this, the, the ones I'm showing you here because of our interest in school mental health is based on the proportion receiving school-based services. But in general, we didn't really see many significant predictors from the studies themselves of what rates were uh, found. So is there really a de facto service system for kids? What do people think now? Probably not, right? We're not really seeing that in the data anyway. Schools were the most common service setting for all children and youth, but among youth with elevated symptoms or already enrolled in a system, uh, outpatient services beat it out by a little bit. Moderator analysis did not uh, see it, find any uh, predictors. Um, so schools may be the most likely to be the first point of receipt to service or entry to service systems, but outpatient care is still quite prevalent. They're, it's more common once kids are known to systems, and we've got to recognize a large proportion of youth with identified need are, are being served by juvenile justice, child welfare, and residential and outpatient settings. Um, so it kind of clarifies that youth truly seem to be served across all these service settings, and it probably varies greatly from, from system to system. Primary care is an obvious setting to invest in. Everybody said that that would be likely to be the number one place that these studies suggest kids are getting some sort of mental health care. But it actually seems to lag, and that seems to be missing an opportunity to be sure. So I'm going to stop there. There's certainly lots of limitations, but we got started a little bit late. Um, I think we'll save uh, questions for all the presentations for after Kimberly's uh, uh, synthesis. And uh, so write them down if you have any, and we'll try to answer at the end here. And here for more information are some of our contacts. Uh, so with that, I'm going to yield the podium to uh, Molly Finnerty. Finnerty. I don't know why that's so hard to say. That must be jet lag, except I've been on the East Coast for nine days now, uh, from New York State. Thank you very much. So it's good to be here. Um, I'm, I'm Molly Finnerty, and I, uh, I'm Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at NYU, and also direct our Bureau for Evidence-Based Services and Implementation Science at uh, New York State Office of Mental Health. I'm going to talk today about the development of some national pediatric antipsychotic quality measures um, that can be used both by states' um, uh, Medicaid programs, but also uh, commercial. So in overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about the policy context for this development, um, the rationale, why focus on antipsychotics in kids, um, what the measure development methods are, uh, the results um, of the process, and our conclusions. So a little bit about the context, or, or really why this matters. Um, Medicaid's uh, CHIP program serves one in three children in the United States. And if you get a measure in, 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 uh, to their core set, that's something that could impact 43 uh, million children in our country. Um, CHIP has a key role in ensuring healthcare coverage and access uh, to care for these low-income children. So there's a shift towards measuring um, quality. And, and uh, this is with, with the introduction of CHIPRA. 
um, 2009, this idea of developing this core uh, measure set to assess the quality of children's health care um, across state Medicaid um, and CHIP programs. And it led to the establishment of the Pediatric Quality Measures Program, or PQMP, uh, um, to increase the portfolio of, of these measures. Uh, so with the goals of developing this core set and to implement um, these measures to ensure high quality of care for children in this program. So the core set includes six different domains, of which one uh, is behavioral health. Um, they're de developed collaboratively, and this is with CMS in partnership with plans, with input of purchasers, providers, consumers, and so on. Fifty states voluntarily have reported on at least one of the measures in this set, um, but just this year uh, there is now a requirement um, that will be established by 2024 uh, to, that this will not be a voluntary uh, submission any longer. It will be a required um, submission. This should talk a little bit about um, the PQMP uh, grant uh, funded project called InSync. Um, and it was, you know, started a while ago and probably, you know, people might know of InSync, the boy band. Um, this was a little bit more of a girl band um, uh, activity, but um, it's, so it's the National Collaborative for Innovation in uh, Quality Measurement um, and has two different distinct phases of grant funding. So InSync phase one was really focused on developing measures and InSync uh, phase two was really on sort of implementing those in real world settings with plans um, and, and trying to see if we could change practice and also uh, revise measures as needed. So why um, focus on antipsychotics? Um, so there had been a concern that antipsychotics were increasing dramatically among children over the past several decades, um, although this has leveled off uh, somewhat more recently. There's also concerns that there are disparities in the use of these medications, that there are higher use for foster care children and also for children in Medicaid programs. Um, in children, in contrast to adults, where antipsychotics are used to treat psychosis, say, in, in kids, it's really much more for behavioral control, um, trying to manage problem behaviors, where psychosocial interventions are really the first line indicated treatments for those behaviors. Um, children are also more vulnerable um, to uh, the metabolic impacts of these agents, but the level of monitoring and oversight they get of the metabolic impacts is much lower than you observe for adults. Um, and there's significant, potentially long-term uh, or even lifelong side effects of the weight gain and other uh, impacts of these agents. So this is just uh, sort of the driving concern of this increase, increase use that's showing both overall um, but, but the disproportionate uh, increase in rates in public insurance compared to uh, privates. Let me talk a little bit about what were the measures of developing this, and I really felt it was an incredible privilege to, to work with NSYNC and, and the NCQA team on developing this. It was really impressed with the robustness of the measurement development process. So it starts out with this environmental um, scan, and here they're not trying to establish evidence. They're trying to find it. So they don't want to work on a problem where there isn't already very powerful consensus that indeed it is a problem. So, so they're, they're really looking, what, you know, what do we know and have, have already identified as a problem? Where is there good consensus so no one will say, who cares about that? It's we already know we care. We already know that there's some meaningful thing that we can act upon or do about it. Um, then there's a phase of developing these measure specifications um, where, and this is really a detailed process where, you know, the methods would be, you know, two pages um, long. It starts out with an idea, what should we measure? But in the end, you need something that um, is very technically specified that any database, any analyst, anywhere in the country running it would get the same answer. So detailed inclusion, exclusion criteria, and so on. Then you're doing some feasibility, reliabil uh, reliability, and validity testing um, in the field with plans. Um, rounds of public comment, there was actually uh, more than one, and then using all of that to get your final specifications, um, and then implementing them 
uh, in the field. So utilize, uh, utilize these by states, uh, plants, and providers. All along the way, there was a stakeholder input. And I, and I think that you know, many of us like to think that we work with stakeholders, that we get input. I mean, this, this was, um, there wasn't a step that was taken that, that many different uh, eyes were on it from many different perspectives. Um, and, and what they said went. You know, if they didn't like it, it was, it was gone. It wasn't, um, yes, but I'm more clever or something like that. It was really the stakeholders ruled. The, the methods used to do some of the testing, so we had two different data sources that we used. Um, one was Medicaid analytic uh, extracts, or MAX files, from 11 states, as well as New York State um, Medicaid um, data from 17 managed care plans. Um, the study population we looked at was children up through um, the age of 20 as of the last day of the measurement year. And there was a series of different types of tests that we did, um, for example, testing the impact of different uh, uh, definitions. If we're looking at concurrent antipsychotic use, do we mean concurrent for um, no uh, overlap period requirement? Do we mean one month overlap, two months overlap, three months? What does that do to your rates? What does it do to the population of children you're capturing? Things like that. Examination of the frequency and characteristics associated um, uh, with these measures, um, uh, looking at managed care plans, testing the feasibility, can they do it? If you make the measure too complicated, it, you know, they have some great analysts out there that they employ, but if it's, if it's too complicated, they, they just they can't do it. They won't do it. Um, and reliability and uh, validity testing. So in the environmental scan, which is that first step we talked about, there's a number of guidelines. So we did a review of all the guidelines. These were published in English that um, were about the treatment of children and in any way mentioned uh, treatment recommendations for psychiatric conditions that may have commented on whether antipsychotics should be used, when they should be used, and how they should be monitored or supported. Um, so a number of guidelines were identified um, and, and commented on an array of different topics, like should they be used in very young children, or should uh, multiple antipsychotics ever be used, or what about dosing, or um, should they be used without an indication, or the psychosocial interventions that should be used first or in conjunction, um, and so on. So there's quite a few guidelines uh, that we were able to identify that made recommendations, and some of them rated the recommendations for either strength of recommendation or strength of evidence. And one of the take-homes here is that uh, that last row, strength of evidence, you can see is um, there isn't a lot of evidence, um, not, a, not a lot of evidence to work with, um, but the, the strength of the recommendations was always stronger um, than the strength of, of the evidence. A uh, proposed measure concept. So these are what comes out of that. And the, and the measure concepts is, is what NCQA calls them. It's really, it's like I have an idea. You know, we should measure this. Um, it doesn't really have any technical specifications attached to it. It's, it's um, you can't run out and measure it, but it's an idea about what's important to measure. Um, so this idea that we should look at use in very young children or look at higher than recommended dosing, um, use of multiple concurrent agents, or use without a primary indication. And in these cases, these would be representing overuse that we might want to look at and want to see uh, go down. And then measuring access to services that should augment or, or supplement or be wrapped around the use of these antipsychotics. Um, are people getting follow-up visits? Are, is metabolic screening going on at, at baseline or follow-up? And uh, what about psychosocial care, uh, either before or during the use of these antipsychotics? And we got um, stakeholder feedback. And again, there was many, many rounds of stakeholder feedback. But just to summarize some of it, is that for the very young and multiple concurrent, there was a concern that these are extremely low frequency, which in some ways doesn't make for a good measure. Um, in smaller plans, there's gonna, it's, uh, you're going to have too, too few counts. On the other hand, there was still uh, support, because they thought this is really important. You know, preschoolers on these agents, uh, pre you know, young kids on, on multiple agents, you know, this is still something we want to keep uh, an eye on. However, in the end, after multiple rounds of review, the very young was dropped uh, uh, due to these low frequency concerns. 
metabolic monitoring. Um, so those issues, well, we want to see at baseline that you've established a baseline. We want to see that it's ongoing. You have to look at both glucose and lipids over time. There was some concerns, well, you know, if we need to start these agents in a hurry because someone's in a crisis, we don't want to have to stop, wait, go to the lab, see that, you know, we have to create some allowance, right? We have to create some wiggle room. So they, I think they got up to two weeks or the first month um, to, to get a, a lab after starting to have it still count as baseline. If you go too much longer, uh, the evidence would suggest you're already starting to see bump ups in weight uh, very early on um, in the course of these agents and, and um, metabolic abnormalities such as hyperlipidemia and hyperglycemia can kick in uh, really quite early too. So um, some allowance, but you don't want to miss, uh, miss your baseline. Uh, over time, all those measures, baseline, ongoing, glucose lipids got merged at a single as a single uh, measure because parsimony of measures is also really important. Um, off-label use, um, so there was concerns that some off-label use may be important uh, and appropriate. And, you know, we particularly heard about this or, you know, from foster care uh, corrections agencies. They're like, you know, what's more important? Do you want the kid to get kicked out of school? Do you want the child to be lose their uh, yet another housing setting? Um, we have to create some room for this. And we said, sure, um, but maybe, you know, maybe this is a sequence issue. You don't want to. You want to jump to that, uh, but you want to make sure that people are being considered um, for psychosocial treatments. So maybe it's it's that we're making room for off-label use. But did you first try uh, psychosocial treatments? And again, they're like, well, what if it's a crisis? So how about wiggle room? So okay, you you had to start it in a crisis, but did you at least also start? some psychosocial intervention that's likely to help that child better manage uh, their behaviors in the long run. Um, this feedback was used to eliminate measures, refine, and combine uh, different measures. So then some early testing of the data, and this is um, something that I guess was recently uh, published, but just, um, and, and there's been other studies like this in the literature showing that there are differences for children um, and foster care and what these performance um, look like in the general population, the foster care population. And, and interestingly, for all of the overuse measures, you do see that the kids in foster care have, have higher measures of overuse, but you also see that they have higher levels of access to care. So they're more likely to get psychosocial service, they're more likely to have their blood uh, monitoring done. So the final specifications, we ended up with these six measures, um, two related to overuse, which were high dose and multiple concurrent antipsychotics, and four related to management, which is that you, if you're using off-label, that you would get a psychosocial uh, intervention early um, or prior to initiation, that um, you would get follow-up visits, um, that you would have metabolic screening at baseline and on follow-up. The next step is this is the grant product, right? Now we're saying, you know, that's great. We did a grant, we got funded, we got some measures, we have this suite, but um, that doesn't matter unless they get picked up nationally. Um, so here, the first step was HEDIS review. So all, of, for people who don't know, that the, all plan, managed care plans in the country get accredited, just like a hospital might get accredited by the Joint Commission. A managed care plan gets credited by HEDIS. They get, they get a, approval that they're a good, a good managed care plan. And there's certain things that they have to do, uh, and, and one of them is reporting on the HEDIS measures. So HEDIS chose three, um, and, and uh, those were the multiple concurrent antipsychotic psychosocial services prior uh, to or within the first month of initiating an antipsychotic and the metabolic monitoring. They did not pick high dose. They thought it's lower priority um, and, low, and low frequency. Um, that this idea of the follow-up that reminded them too much of the ADHD follow-up measure and they thought, you know, eh, we're not, you know, we don't, we don't think that that's um, the direction we want to go. And metabolic monitoring at baseline, um, there, there was this concern that, you know, we can't have plans monitor too many things. It's really an efficiency thing. You remember, there's only one domain related to mental health, and in all of mental health, there's only like six measures or something for kids. You know, you can't take four of them on labs for antipsychotics alone. So you've got to be extremely uh, efficient, and so they were all um, collapsed. And also, the, there was a merger between off-label use and the psychosocial uh, services um, were merged. 
Then it went to um, NQF, and two measures got approved. So of the three HEDIS measures, two were approved, um, and these were the psychosocial services um, and the metabolic monitoring. So these are both uh, access related, not the, there was no overuse uh, measure in this set. And the multiple current was dropped. And in this case, these, you know, these, these groups that are making these important decisions, you know, it might be 10 people. And there could be one guy, um, and one guy who said, you know, I, I use uh, multiple antipsychotics when I treat kids. And they might be the only psychiatrist in the room. And so what happens? People are like, oh, OK. Um, and that's, that's the end of that, of that measure. Um, so, so in 2018, um, you know, which is a, it's a messy process, but probably if we were honest with ourselves, there's many processes in life that look like that, right? Um, one, one person, uh, a respected speaker, um, can change a course of, of how things get done. So uh, 2018, this is the current Chipra child corset that in our country, about a third of the kids, um, will be monitored on these measures, um, and uh, that will be a mandatory uh, monitoring um, in the next four or five years. One uh, set dedicated to behavioral health, and in that, um, there are currently four measures. And um, of those, two of them were a result of this uh, process. And just quickly, um, managed care plans are currently using it as part of their HEDIS reporting. And again, they, those, the three measures are still uh, in there. States have adopted them. For example, in my state in New York, um, there is reporting on the three HEDIS measures that have been included in the New York State's core set. Because it's voluntary, um, you can pick and choose what you want to do. And they did adopt all three of the HEDIS antipsychotic measures. And plans are fiscally incentivized to perform on that. So if you say, well, still does it matter? So in part, we're, we're harnessing the horse thorn effect. It's like if we measure it, people will look, they'll be embarrassed, they'll be motivated, there'll be something. In this case, there's actually money, uh, money attached as well. They will, they will be paid more if they perform better. Um, NSYNC Phase 2 is a quality improvement collaborative uh, this year with five plans, um, all working together to try and um, improve practice. And um, the measures continue to evolve. That's like an, another sort of interesting point. Is it based on this experience? You know, you think you've developed a measure and, and, and there it is. And, and any year, anyone can, that measure can evolve. That measure will, the definitions will change and, and evolve over time. So. Um, in conclusion, uh, antipsychotic use in children remains a, a public um, health concern. Um, you know, I think just a couple of weeks ago, we got something from the governor's office. You know, another article was published. You know, please pay attention to this. Um, you know, what are we doing with uh, with with medicating our very young children? That sort of thing. Um, professional consensus around clinical practice guidelines. We're still in a state where. Um, there's a lot more concern and interest and recommendations related to this than there is good evidence to support uh, those recommendations. Um, the quality measurement is a detailed and uh, multidisciplinary process um, with many phases and rounds of review and um, that, that never end. Um, and that um, measures um, identify room for improvement still. Um, just to acknowledge, for, for uh, this is our uh, NSYNC Phase One collaborators, which was uh, NCQA, NYU, uh, New York State OMH, um, Nationwide Children's in Ohio, and Rutgers participated in that. And just to give you a sense of each of those panels has had many people in them, some had 20, 30 people in them, um, of different uh, groups. Um, so it's just a, a robust, a robust level of input. And this is our NSYNC uh, Phase team. Uh, to team, and uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our attempt to create guidelines for the actual psychosocial services, which has been um, high priority for Washington State for a few reasons. Um, I think I'm actually, before moving into my slides, I'm going to set a little bit more of the policy context for Washington State. I do have a slide 
in there on it, but I think it would be good to tell the story about what we're working in before I, before I launch into some of the slides. So some of you may know Washington State prides itself on being um, having evidence-based policy um, in children's behavioral health. It started in 1996 with the juvenile justice system. Um, the state legislator restricting funding to community programs based on whether they were shown to be evidence-based. And um, those of you at all in that world, and maybe children's you know, mental health around evidence-based practice might know our esteemed local institute, the Washington State Institute of Public Policy, that publishes these cost benefits based on um, these program reviews of effective practices. It's an incredibly powerful entity in our state and one of our um, really valued partners. Um, but at the same time, what that's kind of set up is this uh, approach towards evidence-based practice policymaking that's very tied to these sort of packaged programs that have been tested in clinical trials. And so for rollout and policymaking in the state, we have to figure out how we then uh, define and translate that for actual um, quality monitoring on such a large scale. So that's kind of the, the problem that sets up um, our hopefully reasonable solution that we're continuing to try to um, uh, improve. I got it the right way? All right, so I'll just start off with acknowledgments. So I'm here today representing the Evidence-Based Practice Institute. It's a, it's a state, um, partially state-funded entity um, since 2008 to promote the use of evidence-based practice in children's mental health in our state. Um, as I noted, one of our partners is the Washington State Institute of Public Policy, and then this is also done in really close collaboration with our partners in uh, Washington State over children's mental health. So I'll just kind of note some of the literature that you all are really aware of, um, citing a lot of people in this room, that uh, evidence-based practices, we, as, as uh, Dr. Bruns noted, we have lots of literature on what works, but the actual uptake is really discouraging and rather low. Um, I won't go through each of my bullets, just sort of setting the stage for this. So one of the strategies for potentially increasing use is figuring out how we can even count the baseline in our systems to begin with. How do we start creating, um, how do we create the data to create these kind of learning healthcare systems? So trying to find efficient and cost-effective and feasible tools are really high priority for implementation. And one of the strategies being looked at is therapist self-report. Can we trust therapists to tell us what they're doing? And if we can trust that, can we use that in pretty large scale quality assurance monitoring? So there seems to be some promise there, not only for the, for the opportunity to collect that data administratively, um, but also if you're having therapists having to report practice and you, you potentially provide some guidelines around that, it can be a self-check for them. It can be just a, an immediate QA um, kind of tool and can also provide support for supervi supervision for on-site QA. So using therapist self-report um, seems like something worthy to study and invest in. So the studies so far are kind of mixed. I just want to be really clear that we acknowledge that because obviously this is leading towards us using therapist self-report as our primary way of getting information on the quality of psychosocial services. So here are just some of the studies um, that, you know, that we've been relying on to kind of guide some of our efforts. And the accuracy ranges is in the range right now of like below 50% um, for accurate ther therapist self-report. Okay, so this is, this is again some of the context and background for Washington State. Um, now, even though since 1996 there was initiative in juvenile justice, there hadn't been any kind of legislative mandate um, for the other child serving systems until 2012. And in 2012, the state legislature passed a bill that said that all three child-serving institutions had to substantially increase their investment in evidence-based practices. And so in juvenile justice and child welfare, they just um, counted up the total number of, uh, the total amount of the contracts that they were paying for these um, purveyor systems to come in and train um, on functional family therapy or multi-systemic therapy 
Um, they were able to calculate those because they do them through contracts. But for children's mental health, they're paying, you know, just session by session. You know, they're getting billing by session back, and the state wasn't maybe making very modest investments in training and, and QA, but at any time, any therapist could have been doing evidence-based practice based on training they went out and got themselves or through any other method. And so the, the children's mental health system had to figure out how to count how many of the, you know, thousands of encounters they were paying were evidence-based. So they, uh, and this was prior to evident the EBPI's involvement or really even WISIP's involvement, um, the state decided to just go ahead and set up evidence-based practice modifier codes that got linked to every encounter. And they did this on their own. And so <laughs> the initial data that came in from this had three primary problems. Um, first was that the rates were really, really low. That's my f the first car. <laughs> So people were super scared to report any evidence-based practice because um, they were given a list of like 40 practices and they were said, if you're doing uh, parent-child interaction therapy or if you're doing CBT for anxiety or whatever, just add it to your session code. And of course, everybody is immediately concerned about if they're going to be misreporting their practice or who's going to check if this is like has enough fidelity or this is high enough quality for me to report. So the first one is that the reporting is really, really low. And it's not sure if that's accurate in terms of the, the services being provided or if that's just reluctance to report. Um, the second problem was not so much a reporting problem, but it was that the state had put a bunch of eligible practice, uh, for their, their purposes, a bunch of programs that they said were eligible to report were not evidence-based practices for children's mental health. So what they did is they took the full inventory that had been created for the state across all of the children's serving departments, which included prevention, juvenile justice interventions, child welfare interventions, and children's mental health, and put them all as eligible to report in children's mental health. So it wasn't clear at all. So people were reporting all sorts of things, and it wasn't clear that that was appropriate for the psychotherapy encounter for the treatment modality. So there was all sorts of stuff being reported, um, in addition to actually a bunch of things that weren't on the list at all because they just asked people what they wanted on the list because they were getting so much blowback from even requiring this. And then the third is that, is that um, again, with provider report, they were appending these modifier codes to all sorts of things that had nothing to do with psychotherapy, so like translator services or um, things that, that they were just unsure of really how to report at all, and so if they felt like they were at any point doing something that they were judging to be evidence-based practice, they would just append it to every single code that had anything to do with that case. So suffice it to say, the data that came out of this initiative for children's mental health probably for the first four to five years just wasn't even usable and not very interpretable. So evidence-based practice got involved and the institute got back involved in a more intentional way and, and so we had to sort of figure out how we would provide reporting guidelines to individual providers so that when they were using these codes um, we would all have a shared understanding of what that would mean. So we, we were kind of faced with this dilemma that the information for the evidence-based practices were coming in on an individual session, and we had no other way to like monitor the quality of sessions externally. We had no way to sort of otherwise audit or externally validate what the therapists were doing. This is the statewide system. So it needed to just be good enough for statewide monitoring. Um, so uh, if someone was telling us they were doing PCIT, we needed to be, to be able to tell them, in the session that you just coded PCIT, that session was good enough for you to code for PCIT. So how do we do that? Um, so basically we do it through a combination of trying to conceptually use uh, the common uh, elements literature along with sort of the package name brand literature. And um, I'll go through that in detail. So basically, these are just like the four things that 
that ground um, the eligibility requirements for reporting. One, and I'm going to go through these in a little more depth, we actually um, pre-identify or, or pre-approve a bunch of eligible training entities. They include the name brands, but they also include sort of generics. So that's terminology we've started to adopt around generics versus name brands. Um, two, we've only required ongoing consultation if somebody's reporting for a name brand and the name brand requires it. And I will say, and I might wrap up with some comments about where we're headed with this, because I feel like this is probably the stickiest grayest area for us right now in figuring out. Um, and then because there's no external observation, but we wanted to have um, providers sort of skilled enough to tell us what they were doing, we actually create pretty specific guides or requirements for how they document their practice and their treatment plans and their progress notes based on both the category of treatment they're saying they're using and then common allowable and common elements within those treatments and I'll distinguish between essential elements and common elements. So you can see right here, this is how, this is one of the um, treatment categories for the guides. So we've identified four, four generics based on the most commonly, most common diagnosis and the most common treatments for, and they're all CBT based. Um, this one is our CBT4 anxiety. And you can see there in our um, proved trainings, we've got things like Coping Cat and Coping Koala, but we also have um, just our, one of our uh, training entities in the state that trains most of our providers is called the Harborview, Harborview Learning Collaborative. It's a modular-based training and CBT initiatives. It, it itself hasn't been subjected to like a controlled trial, but it teaches to all the elements for those those um, treatments. So that's also an approved entity. And you can see that the modifier codes here vary based on whether it's a generic training entity, which is 151 for CBT for anxiety, or it's a name brand, in which case it has its own specific code. Although we're heading towards maybe wanting to only have providers reporting in generic categories regardless of what name brand they're using. And this gives you kind of a flavor of how we distinguish um, between essential and allowable elements. So this is where we might be going a little beyond where the science would tell us we can go, but we're taking a leap of faith because what we wanted to be able to do is we were worried that if we just created a list of allowable elements um, and we didn't um, create hierarchies in terms of their importance or which ones were really active ingredients in the treatment category, that in theory you could have a therapist reporting like CBT for anxiety but just doing psychoeducation forever and never getting to any really active clinical elements. So the way that we felt like we could guard against that was identifying which, based on both literature synthesis and consultation with experts in the area, which would be considered the most essential, the most defining of that treatment category. And then the provider has to be able to say in the treatment plan that they intend to do at least one of those. So at least we have a sense that they know what that is and that they are going to try to get around to it. So within each category, there's between like two and four essential elements that they could put in a treatment plan. And then every individual session progress note could have any one of the essential or allowable elements. So as they're writing their progress note, they would just, we, we uh, prefer that they use a language as close as possible to that that's actually in the reporting guides. Um, so it would be easy for kind of auditing or review, um, but that they, but they're able to describe their practice in such a way that it's really clear it's one of the allowable clinical elements of that treatment category. And uh, among treatment categories, there's, you know, 15 to 20 of these that could be used. So um, we've just now started on trying to gather some more systematic data about how these are landing in the field. Um, it was developed with a lot of stakeholder input from our state partners, from provider partners, from our academic partners. And now we've been rolling it out in the state and getting, feed, you know, getting a wider range of feedback from administrators and QA managers and directors. Um, we've been doing workshops regionally. It's about an hour and a half. We, they really heavily focus on people bringing in their case notes and us presenting different um, 
scenarios and then kind of code, going through a process of coding them together. We've trained over 100 folks. And then we were trying to just um, think about some implementation measures that we would put into evaluation of these workshops so we could start getting an idea of kind of um, how the state is reacting to this approach. So just really quickly, these are our um, regions. So you can see that we've got kind of a, we, this, this under um, represents how many people we train. These are just the people we got to respond to our survey after the workshop. So we've gotten 68 um, responses so far. Well, we have more now, but when we pulled this data, we had 68 people tell us what they thought about these. Um, so we, we have representation from all of our regions, but obviously some are pretty low, so we acknowledge that as a limitation. Um, oh, it's hard to see from up here. Those are actually the titles. <laughs> so those are the job titles. So you can see we have primarily directors, supervisors, QA managers, program managers, and that's exactly who we were targeting. We're not trying right now to train directly to providers. We're training to their supervisors and managers. Here's our state coverage. So as you can see, we've trained in all of our regions. Um, feedback, we've gotten inconsistent feedback on them from the regions, but we've had good participation in our workshops across all the, the 10 regions in our state. I just want to make a couple um, comments about our scale construction. So we use the implementation measures that had come out of um, Kara Lewis's work, and they found, um, in their work, they found that their three implementation measures on appropriateness, acceptance, and feasibility um, had kind of distinct they were con distinct conceptually. In ours, if people thought it was great on one, they thought it was great on all of them. So we just looked at that as um, unified scale. And then we also used um, the attitudes towards um, practices uh, that developed out of Torpeda's work. So you can see here, people, 85% thought that um, they either didn't agree or disagree about how appropriate or acceptable these were, or they agreed or strongly agreed. 42% agreed or strongly agreed. Because these measures haven't had any predictive kind of analysis, we don't know like if that means these are acceptable or appropriate or not. <laughs> but it seems to be like they're OK. Um, we're certainly not getting more people saying that they don't agree that these would be appropriate or acceptable. What was kind of interesting is we get basically the same, um, we get the same sort of reaction by all these people on their attitudes to evidence-based practice separately from our guides. So they're kind of viewed as evidence-based practices and the participants responded to us generally think that evidence-based practices are okay, but they're not like ringing endorsements. But interestingly, um, it's only a modest association between the people that uh, think evidence-based practices are really great and people who thought our guides were really great. It's not, it's really not a very robust correlation and um, that's kind of interesting to us. So we think we might be picking up there on folks that might um, be more suspicious of evidence-based practice but like our approach to flexibility or who really like evidence-based practice and are suspicious of our approach to flexibility. So we are, because we are going, a we are sort of conceptually going a little bit outside of the box following some innovators in the field on that. So we'd like to dig into that a little bit more. And then just for fun, um, we went ahead and pulled the region EBP reporting or like utilization rate and lined it up with um, uh, the scores on attitudes to evidence-based practice. Um, and there's absolutely no correlation, <laughs> which is just kind of interesting. And that's just for fun, and we don't know what to make of that yet. But as um, the, we hope the quality of the reporting improves, we'll be able to do um, more of this kind of analysis. All right, so there's lots of limitations. You guys probably have thought of a lot of them as I've been presenting this. Here's some of them. And then uh, next steps for us, we think that these look reasonable enough to go forward. We're definitely looking for opportunities to now refine them, make them even more usable, make them even more useful, refine what we're defining as active elements versus allowable elements. We're considering things like putting in measurement-based care as a requirement for reporting evidence-based practice or trying to pilot test that in some areas. Um, 
and doing a validation study itself of the reporting guides. So if we can, if we can move forward in figuring out if this is a, a good promising strategy, we will be getting um, statewide session level um, report on the use of effective practices for psychosocial services. So we're hopeful this can be a feasible strategy. All right, thank you very much. Okay, well, our presenters have done a pretty good job staying within their time limits, but we started like 15 minutes late. So if I was among you all, if I was coming to this workshop or this symposium, it would be to see Kimberly. So I'm going to try and crunch this down to five minutes somehow. What it was was an opportunity that we had, thanks to uh, Kimberly and ourselves and others, uh, national collaborators, to look at some great data from the Nashville Research Institute of State Mental Health Program Directors for kids and adults asking about um, ways in which uh, their state supports evidence-based practices as well as the level of penetration and adoption of different evidence-based practices. So now, going from Sarah's incredibly practical but very micro-level kind of work in Washington State, we're zooming back out to all 50 states, right? And so the, the setup here, and then I'm going to go quickly to the conclusions because I don't have much time and I want to hear from Kimberly, is that we know that there's been all of these, uh, we've had tons of uh, studies of evidence-based practices, tons of implementation frameworks once we realized they weren't getting done. Our impairment to, due to chronic conditions for kids due to mental health problems is going up, which is tragic. Our funding for research is going down. What the heck do we do? Given that we have seen that adoption of evidence-based practices according to these state surveys has flatlined, and this is a representative uh, response for MST state, across states. The percent of states adopting MST has t maxed out at about 2 or 3 percent, and that's been what we saw across all the EBPs that these state uh, program directors reported on. And investment in, oops, state investment in support for evidence-based practices is actually declining. That trend is actually the percent of state program directors who reported um, unique fiscal allocations to evidence-based practice uh, workforce or other kinds of support. So what do we know? So we, this is data that we published in one paper. The next paper we're about to publish is what is it about states that might predict um, how much support to evidence-based practice implementation they actually have going on in their state? Um, and what is the relationship between those characteristics and actual EBP adoption and penetration? And so kind of what we're uh, zooming in here um, is the, uh, yeah, you're right, it is hard to see this, modifiable outer context that is often referred to. We usually see our research here in programs or organizations, provider organizations, or obviously at the uh, practitioner level, again, because it's probably easier to manipulate the independent variable than state policy contexts, which could be considered modifiable or um, unmodifiable, depending on which variable you're looking at. So what we did was we tested a little bit of a kind of handmade, yet another model guiding our uh, research, not necessarily implementation per se, but we asked about whether or not these state characteristics, re you know, the region of the country, the income of the state, the budget strength of the state, the state mental health authority independence, all these different things that could be considered unmodifiable or modifiable. Um, and modifiable would be like what kind of policies were going on around evidence-based practices? Do we incorporate them into contracts? Do we actually link data sets with other agencies? And EBP funding, so do we have specific budget requests for training on evidence-based practices? Do we modify information systems and so forth? How much does, do these state characteristics associate with the kind of modifiable things we might do to support EBPs? And what relationship are there between either of those things and actual EBP adoption? So I'm going to skip the actual discussion of the methods and data sources. We got our data from, this, from our surveys of the state mental health directors and then a bunch of other sources around state characteristics. Let's leave it at that. Um, and when we tested the relationships between state characteristics and um, multi-level models, etc. So when we tested the relationship between things about the state and the degree to which states actually 
invested in evidence-based practices, we found the following things. Before our analyst went and decided to use um, uh, a certain kind of um, uh, a, a, a more appropriate regression model than we did the first time around. It was really disappointing to see that the a party that controlled the legislator and governor's mansion fell out as a significant predictor because it meant we could no longer call this presentation our blue states more evidence-based. That bummed me out a little bit, but what we were left with is, is that the degree to which a state uh, expanded Medicaid, conducted actual uh, research and evaluation both within and outside the, school mental, uh, the, the state mental health authority, and the degree to which the state mental health authority collaborated with other agencies were all significant predictors of EBP investments. And all this stuff was found to be non-significant. Again, it's tough because it's a small sample size. We're talking states here. You always have this N of about 50. And we did get good data from all 50 states just about from these surveys. When we asked how, what about states is associated with evidence-based policies and the degree to which they were adopted, again, this uh, variable came out of the degree to which the state collaborated with other agencies to implement mental health services came out as a significant predictor, as well as representatives from state government agencies being members of the state mental health uh, authority planning group. So you see this thing about collaboration among agencies being a big predictor of um, evidence-based practice investment. And again, the degree to which the um, state invested in research and evaluation was a significant predictor, probably not surprisingly. And then finally, what about all of this stuff actually predicted EBP adoption? Well, for uh, the kid EBPs that were measured in these surveys, it seemed to be the degree to which policies such as collaboration and data sharing were actually being invested in at the state that predicted the degree to which things like MST and FFT were available, whereas for adult EBPs, it seemed to be simply a question of did you fund it, which is pretty interesting. Right? So for kids, it seemed as though policies predicted adoption. For adults, it was just whether it was funded or not. It didn't, the policies did not. Um, and then finally, what about unmalleable factors at the state level that seemed to predict um, adoption of EBP? Um, interestingly, uh, budget sur surplus uh, uh, predicted and, you know, actually, this is the wrong slide. Hold on one second. I had to uh, put, pull these together. What about states predict support for EBP? Okay, here's our conclusions, because I want to get to Kimberly. So our conclusions are that state EBP investments are associated with collaboration, uh, increased per capita income, expanding Medicaid eligibility, and the degree to which the state mental health authority conducts research and evaluation, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, not surprisingly also, uh, the degree to which um, uh, state evidence-based policies are associated with, I'm sorry, the things that predicted state evidence-based policies being in place, again, collaboration, similar to collaboration, perhaps representatives from other agencies being a member of the mental health planning group, uh, research and evaluation. Um, and one thing that was really interesting is uh, what things actually predicted availability of EBP, and this is where my slide was wrong, unfortunately. But what we did see is, is that policies predicted mo uh, more of the kid EBPs, um, in terms of the adult EBPs, um, it was more about uh, increase in EBP investment. And states had an overall greater EBP adoption index when states directly operated community-based programs, which might be one of the more actionable findings from this study, is, is that the degree to which states directly act, um, implement uh, programs compared to passing it through other entities seemed to be associated with the number and penetration rate of evidence-based practices. Now, I skipped a whole lot of details because I want to get to Kimberly's discussion, but that's just the way it is. Thank you very much. Hi. Glad to see all of you still here. That's great. So what an interesting set of talks. Um, I, uh, I, I feel as though that this is right on the edge of where we need to be in order to build a better bridge between research and policy. And I want to talk a little bit about where I see all of that going and, and why these talks are pointing us in the right direction. So why is policy even something to pay attention to? Let's, let's back it up a bit, especially from the NIMH or NIH side. Well, 
NIMH and NIH as a whole has as its primary mission to impact public health. Public health significance is one of the criterion, you know, for all of the, the grants for very good reason, because that's what the taxpayer dollars should be used for. Greg Simon made, I thought, a very, uh, very interesting point about that, that the real recipients of all of this work are taxpayers, because the money's coming from there, and the, the clients that we're working with. And so the, this issue around policy is important because policies are one of the most important ways, one might even argue the most important way, to maximize public health benefit. That's the whole point of these policies, is to have an impact on as many people as possible. It's the, the John, John Stuart Mill, um, you know, greatest good for the greatest number, consistent with nobody being better off than anybody else. So it's, it's a, a maxim, it's a principle. There are reasons why places like NIMH want to shy away from policy, and those are understandable as well. It's, it can slip into advocacy, it can slip into politics, and science can and, and is and, and probably should be separate from that. It can become very non-scientific, and there's also the, this the time frame, the changeable, dynamic nature of policies. As soon as you th you're trying to grab onto it and study it, it's gone, you know? Something else has happened, whereas research moves much more slowly. But I, I think that those are all things that can be addressed now, and that we have an opportunity to be looking at the policy research interface in ways that, that haven't been possible. For one thing, the methods in order to study complex systems that are changing rapidly, those methods are developing very quickly, and those are enabling us to be able to get a better handle on some of these dynamic systems, the complex systems analyses, um, our, our methods or are allowing methods for actually being able to look at dynamic processes more quickly. But when we think about policy research and contextualizing research within a policy context, there are a number of different directions that might go. There are questions such as how policymakers use research findings. And there are a few people starting to look at that. Jonathan Pirtle is, is one of those. Then there are issues around what factors influence the decision-making of policymakers. There hasn't been very much work done on that, but I think it's, it's an important area. And then there are what research can be used by policymakers to, or what's relevant to policymakers. And that's really what this panel was all about, research that's relevant for the, the mindset or the, the frame, the mental models of policymakers. So if we think about the, what policy context we're talking about, there are states, there's federal level, there are health plans, et cetera. Most of, of the talks today were about states, and that's very, very important because states are where the action is, as, as Eric said. So what are states concerned about? I have the opportunity to have one foot in the state and one foot in academia, and I tell you, that has been one of the best experiences. I don't know why there aren't more people out there who are doing that because, um, it's really a wonderful way to be able to get within the perspective and the, and the, the mental models of policymakers and researchers. But what, what states care about these days are things like quality. As Molly said, you know, HEDIS is, and, and the child core measures are going to be mandated for states to report about by 2020. Pediatric core set are going to have to be reported by states. So they're really concerned about quality because they're going to be held accountable, and accountability is, is another issue that's very much on the minds of states. They have to be accountable to the taxpayers. They have to show what they're doing, what they're doing with the money. Um, improved outcomes is always of real importance to states. Reducing costs, likewise, for, for obvious reasons. And then the feasibility. So if we, we think about what we heard today, I think these talks are, are hitting on all of those issues. So we heard from Molly about the rollout of the quality improvement measures on antipsychotic uh, medications. We saw just how collaborative that process is, almost to a fault, one might say, you know, when you have one person raising their hand and saying, eh, eh. Um, but nevertheless, it's built from the ground up 
with evidence informing the process all the way along the line and identifying measures that are going to be the big drivers for change. So these are important. The antipsychotic medication, Molly was talking about depression measures, those are going to get attention. Those are going to be driving what states are paying attention to. And there's a need for much more development of pediatric measures. The, the, if you look at just the numbers of pediatric measures versus adults, it's so disparate, it's, it's um, kind of sickening, frankly. So we need to put a lot more effort into developing more measures. But these are important because states are being held accountable for it. We need to improve the tools that states and providers can use, and those tools have to be feasible. What Sarah was talking about is a beautiful example of developing a feasible tool that can be used by providers to see whether or not they're doing what they're saying they're doing. Um, and guidelines, practical guidelines, not highfalutin, you know, lofty ones, really practical. It's, it's a beautiful example. We need much more of that, and states are going to be clamoring for it, I would, I would believe. Um, improving understanding of population characteristics. So if, if states are going to be able to roll out anything, they've got to know to whom and where. And what Eric was presenting from Duong, um, and about the, the fact that there is no de facto system and kids are spread out everywhere. In a way, we know that, but in another way, it's really important to have that reinforced. And it suggests, I think, why, why when we see the collaboration you know, coming out on the last um, set of data that you provided, that states collaborating is a predictor of whether they're investing in evidence-based practices. Well, yeah, that makes sense. How long have we been saying the system is fragmented and there has to be, we have to look across all of these systems. So I think those, those actually converge, those findings. And what we're seeing is that not only states, but health plans, both commercial and Medicaid are paying attention to that in the children's field. They're saying we can't just look at the mental health issues or the mental health system. We have to be looking at what's happening in the schools and in juvenile justice and substance abuse. And it's, it's part of our mission now. You know, we're not going to only be able to say we're paying attention to what's happening in our one silo. It's going to have to be across these systems. Daunting as that is, we are at a period where this is, is actually happening and it's more feasible than ever before because the data systems are starting to talk to one another. The types of measures that people care about are starting to converge. And so I think we're, we're, in, we're, we're in just the right time for being able to take advantage of some of these problems that have plagued us for so long to be able to use the methods and the tools and the approaches to do a better job for kids. So, um, so then if we think about kids and policies, and what are some of the unique aspects of kids for which our policies are not quite jiving yet. Um, I've had the opportunity recently to work with Kelly Kelleher and Mike Hogan to look at Medicaid and CHIP policies in particular and to see where is the mismatch between those at the federal level that are supposed to be dealing with behavioral health issues, mental health and substance use, and what is needed in order to be able to address kids' unique issues. And basically, there are four different areas at least, probably more, but four areas in which children are unique and in which if we want to align policies, whether it's state or federal, with, with kids' issues, we have to pay attention to this. The first one is periodicity. It's four Ps, so it'll be easier to remember. Um, periodicity. And that means that kids are changing, developmental processes are going on, we can't get stuck in one diagnosis, we have to be looking at functioning and adaptation and resilience. That's where there's a real need for development of measures that are not going to be diagnosis specific as we're, we're seeing it's happening in NCQA to a certain extent. We have to be able to build in monitoring systems that will be frequent. You can't wait for six months or a year or two years. My gosh, you know, kids are growing up. So periodicity is something that is not built into many of our policies, but it needs to be. Um, a second one is place, and we, that gets back to what you were talking about, Eric, from uh, Duong's work, but where are children, and how can we make sure that the billing is possible, whether kids are in schools, or whether they're in juvenile justice, or foster care, or clinics? 
And so this paying attention to place is especially important when it comes to are these services being paid for even if it's not in a traditional mental health setting. These are differences. If you think of the adult system, it's not nearly as complicated. You can have a diagnosis. It's, it's a serious mental illness. You can have one or two places, and you're going to capture most of, of the adults. It's not true for kids. So place is the second P, periodicity place. Um, third one is providers. And so we heard again from, from Sarah about the, some of the training models, development of the guide, guidelines. Um, but this, this also deals with the competency of the workforce, the, making sure that we're training the workforce, broadly speaking, to be able to deliver effective services and that those competencies are in place, and alternative workforces. So that's where things such as family peer advocates, paraprofessionals, a much broader range of, of professionals of, of the workforce need to be involved, trained, competencies addressed, and then their work paid for. And that, again, is, is unique to kids, but it's critically important for making our policies align with kids' needs. And then the final one is payment models. And we didn't hear a lot about that, but it's, it's driving almost everything that we're, you know, we're all thinking about. So how can we make sure that the, the payers' systems are linked, that the data systems are linked, that the incentives are lined up? States are experimenting with value-based payment options. They're experimenting with accountable care organizations and different ways of, of being able to support those. Um, pay for performance. There's lots of experimentation going on right now around payment options that include children. Anti-poverty programs are being built into a number of these. And yet, we're not seeing a real science agenda that's right there looking at what these options might be and how to craft the best set of health policies and health systems to help kids and families. So I think those four Ps, in a way, capture what the, some of the unique aspects of, of kids and kids' needs are. Um, with that in mind, I want to say that I think this is a wonderful panel. I think that if we're thinking about how to move the field forward, we need to be thinking about some of the unique aspects of kids. We need to be thinking about policies at different levels and, and what those look like. And we need to not shy away from saying, well, it's policy that's not our purview. Well, no, it is our purview. We need to understand it better. And we need to understand how to instill, install data so that policy decisions are driven by data and are able to help more and more kids and families. Thank you.